Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it a beautiful morning here in uh, Torrey Pines? Beautiful. My name is George Johnson, and I'm one of the directors of the uh, Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group. Uh, wonderful to see you uh, happy faces, and also the spouses here, too. I want you to know you are welcome. Uh, we have an exciting program today, backed by popular demand, as they say in Las Vegas. Hey, welcome. You're in the right place. <clears throat> if you need some additional facilities, they're out the back door here and down to the, to the left. Quite a few blocks down to the left. Uh, good to see you here, and uh, I want to introduce you to the, the men that make this program work. Uh, not all of them are here, but uh, uh, Gene is here. Gene is a... Uh, my mentor, he's the one that helped me the most when I first came in the program, and he's still helping people. And then I'm the George Johnson there. I do the programs now for Gene, who used to do them. And then we got Bill Manning back there. Wave to Bill. He's got the box with the red light on it. See, and he's going to take your picture. Uh, and then we got John Tassie. John is way in the back because he's watching you carefully. Uh, he's our webmaster. And he's the one that has the website, which uh, you should be referring to frequently. And uh, then we got Bill Bailey. Here's Bill. He's responsible for this fantastic library. And then Steve. Steve, raise, raise your hand. Here's a guy who's not well known, but has taken over from Gene for being the editor of the newsletter. And uh, what's in the newsletter? Some good news and some old jokes, too. Uh, and then we have Bill Lewis. Bill, raise your hand. Here's Bill. Bill does a summary of the speaker's uh, presentation and puts it in the newsletter, and he is very accurate. Uh, he put in there correctly so my misstatement with regard to a name of somebody. He did it very accurately and so forth, uh, but it's been corrected in the DVD and, and also in the newsletter. I mixed up two, two Nobel laureates, uh, Hubble and Huggins, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, then we got Jim. Now, Jim has got it. There he is with a smile. <laughs> Good for you, Jim. He's our greeter. And uh, if you guys want to volunteer, just let us know. Come down front, and, uh, and if, also if you have any suggestions, let us know. Okay, the news, newsletter, the, not the newsletter, the newcomer package. Uh, all the newcomers get a packet. Okay, anybody missing a packet? It's got a lot of good scoop in there, and it has a front page, a yellow uh, questionnaire, just to get uh, an introduction to the program. And the purpose of that is to, to help us with our database, but uh, more importantly is uh, Gene will give you a phone call, see if you got any questions or, or assistance you needed and so forth. So he'll call you uh, within the week. And now, what's the purpose of our support group? Uh, our, our support group is to help you become your own case manager. You have to manage your own prostate cancer case. Your doctor is very busy. He's got thousands of patients. He sees you now and then, but you're the person that knows your own quality of life issues, and you're the one that should be keeping a notebook, ideally a three-ring notebook, showing all your lab reports, a uh, list of questions you might have, particularly the questions you may have as a result of sitting in these meetings. Take it with you when you go see your doctor. He's going to say, oh, my goodness, this guy is informed. I better be attentive. Uh, now, we're not a substitute for your doctor. Uh, this is our legal statement, so you can't sue me, all right? Uh, and the, the point of this, we're here to share information, not medical professional advice at all. That's also true for our speaker today. All three is a medical professional. This is not a substitute for your own doctor. Isn't that correct? Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Now, what kind of support do we give you? We have a website that I've already highlighted. It's got a lot of good information in there, uh, good videos, uh, background information, and new information. And in this library, we got DVDs. i uh, got a DVD of me. If you're not sick of me by now, buy the DVD, and you'll be assured of that. Uh, 
Uh, actually, uh, that's we try to get these things out uh, a month afterwards. And thanks to to uh, to Bill, who does an expert job of editing. Also, if you just want to see the slides, you don't have to listen. You can just look at the slides. You can skip over uh, the verbiage and go to the slides by by getting that DVD. Ten dollars. I get nothing for it. So. Uh, books, look at the books we got. We got some best sellers there. Uh, some of them are still the best sellers uh, at, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, Amazon. And we got some papers and we got some free literature outside. Uh, the newsletter, wonderful editing job in some ways. Uh, we have an outreach program. Uh, if you're a member of any group that you think we might want to uh, talk to, uh, Gene and I have snappy 20-minute presentations on uh, prostate cancer. If you want us to come to your church group or Rotary or whatever, we're available to do that for you. Uh, but you're a key element in our outreach to new members. Uh, we have a, our brochure. Grab some and give it to your friends, your friends, your male friends your age should know about prostate cancer and get a PSA test. Uh, monthly meetings. Dum -da -dum. Here it is, a panel of experts. We do this uh, every few months. The experts are you. Uh, we want uh, three volunteers for next month to talk about the treatment program, what, what you learned, what lessons did you learn, uh, would you do it again, uh, your, your own insights. This is a patient focus group, and this is what we'll be focusing on, are the patients, and sharing the experience and so forth. And after those uh, three snappy presentations, we're going to break out into sections uh, so you can network on a particular treatment you might be interested in. So uh, be with us next month. Uh, we're interested in meeting ideas. Uh, one just was surfaced uh, to me uh, just a few moments ago. If you will, the financial aspects of prostate cancer. How do you pay for the treatment? Uh, how, how, is, how good is the insurance company coverage? Can you get some special considerations? Uh, what's the best way to handle the finances? And uh, what do you do if the insurance turns you down? Things like that. Well, isn't that a wonderful subject? All we need is a speaker. Uh, so if you've got any suggestions, uh, let us know. All right, let's do our, our uh, survey. Uh, we do this for the for our speakers uh, education and also for newcomers and uh, also to get you to participate. Uh, how many are here for the first time? Raise your hand, please. Look at that. We got a lot of newcomers. Welcome. Keep coming back. All right. And how many have been recently diagnosed in the last six months? Okay. Well, come back again. You're going to learn some things today and in the future meetings. Uh, how many have had prostate cancer for one year, up to one year? Okay. How many have had it up to four years? Okay. This is our, we're looking for our peak here, four years, quite a few. Now, for you who have had it four years and have some wonder and concern, uh, how long you're going to be around? Okay, let's do five to ten years. Raise your hand. Look at those hands. How about that? And now, 11 to 15 years. Raise your hand. See, it's working. Okay, anybody higher than 15? Okay, back there, how many? 27. 27. Do I hear higher? A little bit lower. How about you, Bob? What are you now? I'm 24. 24. I'm 19. Uh, so we got some long-term uh, survivors here. Um, Jack, you're our winner again, and uh, you get a free attendance next month. Okay, let's do the treatment survey. Now, some of you have had every treatment here, uh, but every time it was mentioned, raise your hand. How many now have not had treatment but are on active surveillance? Raise your hands. See how many we've got? It's growing. It's growing. Good for you. Uh, how many have had prostate surgery of all kinds? That used to be the gold standard. Now, let's see what happens when I ask for radiation. How many have had radiation? See, now that's the, that's the newer treatment. This, this has been changing over the years. Uh, how many are on ADT, or hormone therapy? I am. Uh, 
that's an important subject. We covered that last last month, and uh, if you're interested in that, particularly people who are on uh, active surveillance or, or have had other disease uh, treatments, uh, you're probably going to have to do uh, 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 ADT. It's uh, later in the program of your recovery, and that's why it's maybe you want to get a DVD and look that over. See, it's not me. I didn't go near it. Okay. How many are on chemotherapy? Or have been on chemotherapy? Okay. Uh, let's do new treatments. Uh, Zytiga, uh, cryo. How many are on that? We don't have that many. Uh, who, Jack, what have you had? Zytega. Zytega. Provenge. How about homeopathic? Cannabis. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thought so. Provenge. Tofico. Extending. Extending. Right. Okay. Extending. All right, recurrence, how many have had recurrence after your primary treatment? See, that's the thing that comes down the line. If you're fortunate, uh, it'll eventually maybe come back, and uh, by the time it comes back, there'll be some new treatment for it. How many are undecided, don't know what to do next? Look at that, see, I'm in the same category. I'm undecided. Uh, now, let me ask uh, a question. Somebody suggested this. This is for a special interest. And if you have a special interest when we do this survey before the meeting, let me know and I'll question our group. But uh, the special interest here is how many have had a biopsy, a bone biopsy? How many have had a bone biopsy? How many is that? Well, I got one, two, three, four. Is that it? Four? A bone biopsy where? Uh, rib and sternum. Rib and sternum. Okay. Where else? 11-12. Uh, 11-12. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Did they find anything? Did they find anything? No. Did they find anything? Or they did. All right. That's the most inherent question. Did they find something? So many people had it and they didn't find anything. How about uh, back here? Did they find anything? Uh, that was tumor. Tumor. Okay. Uh, it's not okay they found a tour, but uh, thank you for your response. All right. So, uh, all right. Thank you for that. Okay. We need your support. Uh, we're a nonprofit, 501c3, tax deductible. Uh, we're not affiliated with any religious or medical uh, organization. Uh, so uh, I'd like to pass the baskets. You'll notice these are small baskets. So we like big bills to fit in those small baskets. A big bill's got a zero on it, maybe two. Now, you don't have to put a two zero. But uh, this is not, not an inexpensive meeting to run. And I know you want to do what you can. And every amount, regardless whether it's got zeros or not, is, is welcome. All right, these are our six principles of case management. Number one, early detection. Get that PSA early. Ignore the, the uh, task force saying you don't need one. You do need one. You want to know, is it better to learn too early that you got prostate cancer or too late? Get it early. Uh, High-definition diagnostics. High definition, because there you want to look for the primary uh, tumor cell, and uh, also it leads to targeting for a biopsy. We're going to hear some about high, uh, high definition uh, uh, diagnostic uh, this morning. Uh, the targeted biopsy, don't the random one, you get a random result. You want it targeted. Know your Gleason score, because once you know that it's a 3 plus 3 or 6, you're a prime candidate for active surveillance. If it's a three plus four or seven, 
Now you have to maybe want to get a second opinion on that biopsy to find out whether it might be a 4 plus 3 or all, all 4, because that's a benchmark right there between a 3 and a 4. There's two different kinds of cancers. One's inactive and the other's very active. And then if you've got a, 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 a 6, you're a prime candidate for active surveillance. Uh, and now, then as after that, uh, treatment selection, and we're going to hear about uh, laser therapy, focal laser therapy, a treatment selection for you to consider. So those are the programs that we emphasize here so you are informed. Now, today's agenda. We got a, we got a special event here. We got our speaker, as they say in Las Vegas, backed by popular demand. We got Bernadette Greenwood, and she's a joy. She's a special person. And what makes her special? Well, you're kind of wondering, well, what's a woman doing in a prostate cancer meeting? Uh, I think she's seen more prostates than most urologists uh, because she's so active in the imaging of, of uh, this disease. Uh, she got her early start as a combat medic. And then she got her bachelor's degree in, uh, in radiologic uh, sciences. And she's working on her PhD in, uh, in tumor immunology uh, imaging. Try to say that fast. That's, uh, and, uh, and, and so she's got a wonderful uh, CV, curriculum vita. She's got awards and she's published papers. Uh, she has a special skill. She founded uh, a few years ago the, uh, a, a new uh, network of international uh, specialists in laser therapy. And that's to get uh, this new technology shared and to get a cooperative uh, endeavor for, for this wonderful technology, and she'll be talking about that. And lastly, she is a vocal uh, activist for patients, patient care, and uh, she's on a number of uh, activities with Prostate Cancer Support Group. We're fortunate to have her today. Bernadette, please join us. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's really good to be back. Um, I'm going to get my memory stick popped in here and get going quickly. But I can't tell you how happy it makes me to see George and Jean year over year over year and to see all the hands go up for long-term survival. So that's why we're here. And today I'm going to give you a technology update, not just about imaging and image-guided biopsy, but I'm going to talk a little bit about other imaging besides MRI, uh, PET-CT. Uh, there's a new agent that was just released the end of last year called Axomen. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And we'll also talk about the clinical role of genomics in prostate cancer management. So of the guys in the room who've had a prostate MRI, who had an MRI-guided biopsy? And of those guys that had MRI-guided biopsy, do you know if they ran genomics on you or histology only? I'm sorry? Ask one at a time. Did they do? Did they, do, did they do genomics as well as histology? They're going to do histology no matter what. But does anybody have their genomic results? One guy in the room. They didn't, they were sent on the yeah, so when you had your follow-up consultation with the urologist or the oncologist, they would have gone through your Gleason score and made mention of genomic profile at that time. So if they didn't mention it, likely he didn't have it. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Yes, sir. I requested it specifically. Nothing offered. Good for you. Post-surgery post on a pathology specimen. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about how we got into a genomics program and why we order the test that we order. It's the Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group, IPCSG. This one? Double click on that. Okay. Off to the races. And I wanted to introduce two special guests. I, I, in my occupation, you can imagine, um, you know, kind of working 6 in the morning to 11 at night, you make a lot of sacrifices, being a mom, being in school, being a worker bee. I have my youngest son and my youngest daughter with me. So say hi to Joe and Heidi. 
And a lot of people also ask me, you know, why do you do what you do? Does your dad have prostate cancer? Did your husband have prostate cancer? I have two sons, and I want to figure this out before they're at an age when they need answers, right? So everything I do is, is for the men in my life that I love. That being said, thank you, sir. Thank you. And let's see, I got a laser. I love it. Okay, so I have nothing to disclose. I've been affiliated with different companies over the years, but I'm not affiliated with any, any manufacturer or any pharma company. Um, if things work, I talk about them. If they don't, I talk about them in the context of why they don't work, and I offer the company help to make it work. Um, this is a declaration from Governor Scott Walker uh, from June of 2015, declaring June 4th Prostate Cancer Awareness Month in Wisconsin. You notice the Marquette sweatshirt on my son. Uh, we're closely tied to Wisconsin, so I do a lot of advocacy work there. Today we're going to talk about the history of biopsy strategies, the evolution of multiparametric prostate MRI, technical aspects of MR-guided biopsy, rationale for MR-guided laser focal therapy of prostate cancer in appropriately selected men, and an update on NCT 02243033 which was the phase one clinical trial to evaluate safety and feasibility of prostate laser, which is now converted to phase two, which is to determine the efficacy of it. And we measure that through looking at rates of biochemical recurrence, rates of metastasis, and all causes of death. And then we're also gonna, like I said, touch briefly on the role of genomic classifiers for risk stratification. So my original research was in breast cancer and breast cancer CAD development, computer-aided detection, in-bore MR-guided biopsies of breast cancer. A lot of what we learned in breast cancer can be applied to prostate cancer. Initially, it wasn't smart to replace PSA digital rectal exam and trust biopsy with MRI because everybody did it different. You know, it's like my banana bread recipe. You know, it might not be as good as my grandmother's because I put my own spin on it. When you've got people putting their own spin on something as important as prostate MRI, you need organizations like the ACR and AdmiTech and the European Society of Urogenital Radiology to build a guideline or to, to establish minimum standards. So what we could do is, much like what we did in breast, we can augment the old standard of care and build in new technology to um, uh, optimize detection, early detection and treatment. So my, my philosophy has long been, if it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. So if I could see it, I could stick a needle in it. If I could stick a needle in it, I can analyze it. And if I could analyze it, I know what the heck I'm dealing with and we could treat it or not treat it because active surveillance can be an option. So that phone that was ringing earlier, that's not the same phone that you used in 1983. So why should your prostate cancer management be the same strategy as it was in the 1980s? Prostate cancer is the only disease um, I had the privilege of uh, dining last night with um, two radiation oncologists and a radiologist from Scripps, and we just were shaking our heads talking about how it's taken so long for this technology to evolve for prostate cancer. When you've got like Susan B. Komen and all these breast cancer organizations and lobbyists, I want you guys to have a loud voice and, and many voices. So what you learn today, take back to your doctors, take back to your elected representatives and make sure you've got funding, you've got a voice, and you've got research moving forward. So the problems in the year 2017, screening for prostate cancer is associated with overdiagnosis and overtreatment. That's a problem. Systematic trust biopsy has a false negative rate in the literature, in the urology literature, of something around 30 to 35 percent of missing clinically significant cancer. In some papers, the rate of misclassification is as high as 47 percent. So, um, you know, I tell people I could throw chicken bones on the floor and tell you better what's going on than some of these techniques. Um, systematic trust biopsy will under Gleason score 30 to 40 percent of the time. It underestimates pathological staging 15 to 25 percent of the time. And 26 percent of patients on active surveillance harbor undetected clinically significant prostate cancer, and three to five percent of them end up with metastatic disease. Um, there's morbidity associated with whole gland therapy, and um, we have to look at biochemical recurrence and determine local recurrence versus distant METs. So in the old days, I'm going to talk about the history, and we'll do a walk through the literature since the 1920s to today of how prostate biopsy has evolved. So in the 1920s, they would do an incision in the perineum 
The perineum is the skin surface between where you poop and where you pee, and they do an incision and then poke out cores from what they could touch and feel. Then they put a sound down the urethra and put a finger in and guide the needle to the posterior part of the gland. Then Watanabe-san and his colleagues came up with the first clinically useful ultrasound images in the 1960s, the late 1960s. And that's when McNeil described zonal anatomy. So like if I'm giving somebody directions to the store, you know, I want to talk about the same landmarks. So whether you're a pathologist, a urologist, a radiologist, a surgeon, you want to talk about what's going on in relationship to other known structures so everybody's talking about the same thing. So another thing that evolved in the 80s was transducers for ultrasound. We could do intracavity imaging so we could see the prostate a little bit better, but all we could really see was the edges of it. You couldn't really see what was going on inside. Dick Ablin developed the PSA test, which was FDA cleared for screening in the 80s, and the sextant biopsy schema was uh, developed. So the sextant scheme was six random cores, the little red dots here. And then Stamey and Eskew said, well, if six is good, 18 must be better. So they came up with a laterally directed extended schema, which was the red, the blue, and the green. Problem with that is what if it's here, what if it's here, what if it's here, what if it's here? You could still miss. And that's just in the X and Y direction. What about the Z depth? How deep are we going? Most missed prostate cancers, around 30%, are in the apex. So, you know, we, we need to use imaging wisely as a guide for biopsy. And then sometimes what they would resort to is something called saturation biopsy, whereby a template is put on the, pro, on the perineum and the prostate is accessed through the skin surface of the perineum. Uh, my friend, Dr. Tom Palasik, um, gave me these slides very generous with his intellectual property here. And I always tell this story for you new people. It's a funny story for you, you know, frequent flyers at the, at the meeting. It's, it's an old story. But um, I was invited to a meeting about seven years ago and saw that Tom Palasik was the chair of the meeting. And I'm like, that guy tried to kill me when I was 12. So I Googled him and it was him. And so I emailed him. I'm like, hey, Tom, always wonder what happened to you after seventh grade. I see you became a urologist, good job. It's been 36 years since you grabbed me by the ankle in the deep end of the Hillcrest Junior High School swimming pool during gym class and tried to drown me. But it's a good thing I don't hold a grudge. I'll see you at the meeting. So needless to say, <clears throat> we get along, we hang out now, and we share slides. And I think I just um, uh, co-authored a chapter in a textbook that he edits, the second edition of the focal therapy textbook, uh, co-authored the chapter on transrectal laser. So um, getting back to saturation biopsy, you could see on the ultrasound monitor, you've got the gloved hands of the individual performing the biopsy. You've got this gray blob here, which is the prostate. You've got this white line that's the inferior wall, the urinary bladder. The black stuff is pee, and these two bright lines are the needle going into the gland. Well, what are we getting specimens of? Any, gu any guesses? I don't know. I'm, a, I'm an imager. I'm an imaging scientist, and I don't know what he's taking a piece of. So the problem with... Um, saturation biopsy is you're, you're getting lots of cores, you're covering a big area, but what are you getting? You just don't know. And after you've done ABC, one, two, three, I've sunk your battleship, you end up with this. And so when people argue and moan about the cost of prostate MRI, oh gosh, it's so expensive, look at this, this is what's expensive. And I, I liken it to exploratory surgery, you know, it says, good news, the exploratory surgery turned up negative, right? So, you know, you're walking around with a bruised perineum and 100 cores, and it's negative, but your PSA is 27. I see it all the time. And it's because nobody did an image before they did the biopsy. So in the 2000s, the team at Charity Berlin did the first in-bore MR-guided biopsy. Very straightforward. See what you're looking at, take a picture of it, and stick a needle in it. And I'm not that smart. So the bottom line is, what do you want guiding your biopsy, this or this? That's an ultrasound, that's an MRI. So the NCCN has come a long way since 2009, when the guideline literally was bad test after bad test after bad test. If it's inconclusive, just repeat it. Yikes. What woman in the room would accept a negative breast biopsy and just being told, go home and we'll biopsy you randomly next year? Not me. So then the guidelines in the 2010s came to mention multiparametric MRI, that it could be helpful, which is great. 
the ESUR guidelines came out in 2012, from which AdmiTech and the ESUR formed an international working group. I've been a part of this for about nine or 10 years for standardization of acquisition and reporting techniques. And this is where the ACR PIRADS committee came from. And I'm currently serving on the protocol optimization subcommittee of that organization. So the goal here is to make sure that people can't say, oh, well, everybody does MRI different. That's why MRI is useless. Well, now everyone's doing it the same. The lexicon is the same. The protocol is the same. The scan acquisition parameters have a minimum standard and everybody is doing the right thing the right way. So the way that it is worded here, when an imager looks at your prostate MRI, things can look funny. What can look funny? Cancer can, but also infection, malign um, uh, inflammation, things like granulomatous prostatitis, tuberculosis. We see everything but an ovary in there. So um, if we see something that looks super funny, we give it a five. If we see things that don't look too bad or they have hallmarks of benignity, eh, give them a two. Now what I'd like to see is the guideline committee change this language because we're not diagnosticians in terms of when a radiologist reads a report, I don't think it's his or her place to say that is or isn't cancer. I think it's their place to say, should we biopsy and with what level of urgency? And a five should be biopsy immediately. Four should be needs a biopsy. Three should be probably doesn't need a biopsy but wouldn't hurt. Two is eh, doesn't need a biopsy. One is don't bother. See what I mean? But that's a language thing that I've been working with the committee on for a couple years, so we'll see. So when you guys get your MRI reports and it's a PIRADS-4, take a breath because it could be infection, it could be inflammation. 4 does not mean malignancy. It doesn't mean Gleason-4. It doesn't mean stage 4. It means PIRADS-4. How funny does it look? Kind of funny, okay? Now, we'll look at some funny stuff. This is a five all the way across the board. It's big, it's black, it's dark on T2, it's dark on the ADC, it's bright on the high B value diffusion image. Now these two images, this one is a derivative of this. We use a certain type of pulse sequence that exploits tissue characteristics to show us cellular compactness. So Einstein in the miracle year described Brownian motion, which is water molecule movement in tissue. So in inflammation, infection, or malignancy, cells get packed up tight together like bricks, and they don't move around so much. The water doesn't have any room to move around. So that's how we can measure apparent diffusion coefficient, and that's how we could see these areas of um, decreased diffusion. And then there's something called perfusion, which is another functional sequence that we do that shows contrast uptake and washout. If it gets sucked up and spit out really fast, that's high perfusion. That's also an, an indicator of infection and also malignancy, sometimes inflammation. So if this thing possesses all these hallmarks of malignancy, and I've looked at it on my CAD system, and I've measured the perfusion, I've done a segmentation, I've got the gland volume, I've di divided the PSA by the gland volume to get the PSA density, I've seen this thing in every plane, I can stick a needle in it, right? So um, let's look at what the NCCN guidelines evolved to in version 2 of 2016. Multi-parametric MRI followed by lesion targeting may maximize the detection of high-risk disease and limit the detection of low-risk disease. Duh, right? And this was the brilliant committee that came up with that statement. Now, these guidelines change every few months. And so some new people get on the committee and that language goes away. So if you can't see it in the 2017 guidelines, don't be surprised. But I cling to that one slide because they said it once and I'm sticking to it. And it's their own literature, so. Now, we proved um, the group at Radboud University Nijmegen in 2006 how pulse sequences behave when combined. That's how multi-parametric MRI got its name. T2 weighting is a parameter, diffusion's a parameter, VCE is a parameter, done independently, they're not so strong, but these three combined, very powerful test, 91% accuracy, that's pretty good. Then the Yale group a decade later proved the same thing. Their results were even better. So make sure wherever you're going to get your imaging done, don't go to Acme Imaging in Moline, Illinois. No such place exists, but if such a place did exist, don't go there if they just opened their doors two weeks ago. You want to be going to a place that's got a person who's well-trained and um, a technologist that knows what the heck they're doing. 
So again, I'm going to talk about apparent diffusion coefficient values and what they mean. There's an inverse linear relationship between ADC and aggressiveness of disease. So here we have 3 plus 3, some asymmetry. You don't see this thing on this side. It's there by itself, and it's kind of gray. It stands out. And then, look, this one is darker. The ADC is lower, and it's a higher Gleason score. This one's practically black. The ADC is even lower, and it's Gleason 4 plus 5. So is it perfect? Does it work every single time? Is it a rule to live by? It's a rule to, to heed when, when you're doing these interpretations. And like everything, nothing's 100%, but this is much better than chicken bones on the ground. So let's look at this other case, abnormal, 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 crazy perfusion. Now, when we plan this biopsy, look at where I put the cursor here. I put it on a, on a voxel with an ADC of 691. If I just move that voxel, that cursor over four voxels, now look what the ADC is. Do you think I'm in the malignancy anymore? No, I'm in the habitat, but I'm not in the tumor. Here I'm in the tumor. So do you think with a random trust biopsy you can get this level of accuracy? No. Do you think you can get good genomics off something that's taken randomly? No. I can't pierce Gene's ear and tell him what the genomic profile of his tumor is. I need to be in the tumor, and I need to be in what I believe to be the most aggressive component of the tumor because these things are heterogeneous. And you can't just say because you got in the middle of it, you got the worst of it. You've got to see the worst of it and stick a needle in the worst of it to get the best information out of it, whether it's histologic grading for Gleason score or whether it's RNA for genomic profiling. <clears throat> so this is, in a nutshell, the problem with trust. You could miss everything completely. You could pick up something inconsequential, or you could skim the edge of the habitat and miss the aggressive disease completely. And the problem is, you know, you've got the throw of the needle, and sometimes these far anterior things in a big gland, you could biopsy this man every year for 20 years and miss that thing. So that's the problem with trust. And everybody says, oh, but it's so fast. Fast is great, but accuracy is everything. And we can do these in bore biopsies in under half an hour. So the speed issue is a non-issue. And um, John Wayne says, life is hard. It's even harder if you're stupid. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and if anybody needs literature to back up what we're doing, um, the techniques were published by me in the Proceedings for the Society for Photonics and Medical Engineering way back in like 2009. None of this is new. It, it's just kind of been not embraced in some communities. So, but we have it here. Uh, we're doing it at Scripps, UCLA, Desert Medical Imaging. All these places are doing targeted biopsies. So you should have good luck getting it done if you need it. And this is the literature that supports it. Um, more substantiation. The team in Nijmegen compared random biopsy to MR guidance. My gosh, for Gleason 7, we're like a 90-something percent detection yield. Uh, random biopsy, you know, like 50 percent, you know, toss of a coin. For the guy, it's not that big of a deal. We insert a little device the size of my index finger, even smaller. We pop it in the rectum, and then we mount this clamp stand to the MRI table to hold it in place. And this thing functions two ways. It's both a receptacle for the biopsy gun, which gets inserted down the barrel, and it's also a fiducial marker. We could see two parallel lines and plan the trajectory to achieve the target, which is the tumor, the most aggressive part of the tumor. And the user interface is super slick. It's very fast, very easy. Like I said, you know, to say it takes time, it, it takes about a half hour, but it's super accurate. We do this by placing a cursor on the tumor that we want to take a specimen of, and then the computer calculates how far we need to angle in the left, right, front, back, and head, foot directions to get the proper trajectory to put the biopsy gun right down into the tumor. And now when people talk about fusion techniques and merging an MRI with an ultrasound, while granted it's better than random truss biopsy, there's some issues with that fusion, and in the published literature there's a plus minus three millimeter skew in the X and Y directions. When we define a clinically significant tumor as five millimeters in size, but the miss potential is six millimeters, that in my mind is a little bit of a problem, which is why we don't do fusion. There are some people that are experts in fusion in the world, and if they send me a patient that they did a fused biopsy on, 
Our team in research will accept that, but generally any man in our program has to have an MR-guided biopsy so that we can exclude higher grade disease. And this is what it looks like. When the specimen comes out, it's a wormy little piece of tissue about the caliber of angel hair pasta. And it's about 1.7 centimeters in length. And then this is what goes off under the microscope and gets stained and sliced. And then we get back a report. I designed this report with Dave Bostwick and I have it so the worst of the worst is described in red. A summary of what's going on is put in a table. The photomicrograph is coupled with a JPEG of the MR image that demonstrates where the needle went. So people can't go, oh, well, it was on the right side, oh, it was on the left, no, anterior. You know where it is, you can see, it's inarguable. In a court of law, we could say where that tissue specimen came from. And then when we talk about grading, there's the, there's the classic Gleason score, there's the classic Gleason score, the ISUP modified guideline from 2005, and then the proposed Epstein grading guideline of stage one, two, three, four, five, which made me think of the riddle, when does four plus four equal four? With the new proposed guideline, because three plus three will be one, three plus four will be two, four plus three will be three, four plus four will be four, and everything else will be five. And it's just Skittle sorting, is all Gleason scoring is. We do this lesson every year for the newcomers. If you have your specimen taken and put, on, put under a microscope. The pathologist's job is to declare the primary Gleason grade, what there's the most of, and the secondary Gleason grade, what there's a the second most of. If everything is three, it's a three plus three. If it's three plus four, it's seven. If it's four plus three, it's also seven. But four plus three has a worse prognostic picture than three plus four, because four was the dominant cell pattern that was the primary Gleason grade. Does that make sense? Everybody get me? Okay, anybody not follow me? Okay, just checking, pop quiz at the end. So, um, and then it's also important that in the report that you're looking at, you know, have the pathologist describe which method they used. So there's this little issue of inter and intra-observer variability. Give pathologist A and pathologist B the same specimen, they may say two different things. Give pathologist A that specimen at eight in the morning, give it back to them at one in the afternoon, and they may say it's two different things. That's intra-observer variability. So, you know, I'm a fan of artificial intelligence. I like to see things like um, edge detection and pattern recognition so that the human error part of this thing can be taken out of the equation and we could have human beings approve and QC things but maybe get some standardization among the um, scoring systems because if one guy's using this and another gal's using that and then somebody else is using that, it's uh, kind of unhelpful, right? So that being said, this is the paper on intra-observer variability, if anybody's interested in reading that, actually there's two of them. So, once I have the specimen, I send it off for genomic testing. If the man consents to have his tissue put into a repository for a 1.4 million genome panel, I get his signature and I put him in that study. Now let's talk about phase one, the laser interstitial thermal therapy. In carefully selected men, this could be a potential treatment. What we do is we use the same device that we used for the biopsy, but I converted it from a biopsy system to a therapy delivery system in 2009. So in 2010, it won the Medical Design Excellence Award, and I went to my GM and said, why don't we do therapy with this thing? You know, stick poison or nanoparticles or energy or something in the gland using the same planning method. And he's like, here's you know, a few months and 30 grand, go figure it out. So I made a really long list of what doesn't work in MRI because I didn't want my engineers chasing their tails on stuff that won't work that I know won't work. And I made a very short list of things that might work. One was cryo and the other was laser. The reason I didn't pick cryo is because it's like a Tootsie Pop. You want the chocolate, but you get the candy and you can't unring the bell. You know, cryo is regional, not truly focal. But the laser had been used in the brains of children for intractable epilepsy. So instead of doing a full-on craniotomy on the kid, they drill a burr hole in the skull, advance a 980 nanometer fiber into the brain, and then cook the tumor. The precision and controllability that they could contour with while laying down boundaries to protect other structures was very attractive to me. I thought if you could stick this in a brain of a kid, I could stick it in the little brain of a man, right? <laughs> so 
this, this device is what's inserted, and it's a, it's a cooling catheter. It's not a urinary catheter. It's a cooling catheter applicator that the laser fiber goes into to cool everything but the energy diffusing tip. We don't want to burn along the length of this thing. We only want energy emitted from the very tip, okay? And we put it down the barrel, the same thing that we used for the biopsy. And we use an interface that allows us to create thermal maps. Um, all this stuff is FDA cleared for soft tissue necrotization, not cancer treatment, which is why this is an investigational, experimental clinical trial. It is not a approved for the purpose that we are using it for, which is the reason why we're studying it. And everything is FDA cleared up to 1.5 Tesla. So when you go to these meetings and everybody screaming 3T, 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 when I worked at GE and we were marketing the 3T magnets, it was for neuroimaging, it was for spine imaging, it was for things that don't move. What are the enemies of MRI? Air, metal, and motion. So in the brain, when we do 3T imaging, we get all this susceptibility at the air tissue interface of the sciences, sinuses and the brain tissue. Same problem in the pelvis, but worse. So you got peristalsis down there, you got bowel gas, you got involuntary spasm or whatever. Some men have bilateral hip arthroplasty or implants in their hips. All these things contribute to really bad image quality. So we're fans of one and a half Tesla. And the reason I bring this up is because if our goal is access to MR for all. The worst thing we could do is limit access to three Tesla. So the ACR Pyrads committee was unambiguous that 1.5T and 3T are equally good for detection and localization of clinically significant disease. Are they equally good for you know crazy metabolite spectroscopy and research stuff? Probably not, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is seeing it, localizing it, and sampling it and both are equally good. What you'll notice also is that in the United States, the number one and a half T magnets far exceeds the number three T magnets, and everything other than three T that's not one and a half T is less than one and a half T. So all the early interventional work for prostate MRI was done on these magnets. We migrated it to here because all the devices that we use are FDA cleared up to one and a half T. So what's more important than field strength, if anyone wants, anyone wants to give you a field strength argument, talk about the operator, the technologist that's doing the scanning, the software, is it a modern magnet? If it's a modern one and a half Tesla magnet and it could do high B value diffusion imaging, it's perfect. Coil choices, if you're using a two channel coil versus a 16 channel coil, you know, you might have Im image quality issues. Patient preparation, those of you who had an MRI, were you told not to eat anything after midnight? Were you told to you know, do certain things to make sure that your imaging was perfect? These are the kind of things that matter more than field strength and ultimately the skill of the interpreter. If you have a radiologist that's been doing this for 15 years, you're gonna get a better outcome. And this is just a pictorial example. The lighting is bad so you can't really see how awful this is. I mean, it's pretty bad. Um, but you compare it to this one, this is one and a half T and this is three T. And then it's on the same patient. Here we have same patient, three T, one and a half T, and I'd argue the one and a half T is better. So, and look at, the, look at the artifacts. See this curved line going through here, all the blurring? So one and a half T has strengths. And at, AC, at ASCO last year, Hasha Med from UC London presented the promise results which was MRI screening done at one and a half T with a phased array coil. And it was a very powerful study. So let's talk about the FDA status of the laser. It was first approved in 2006, had multiple iterations of FDA evolution. Um, what a lot of people don't understand about MRI is this is the user interface on the MRI scanner. We can plug in parameters like echo time, repetition time, flip angle, bandwidth, field of view, all these things that do influence tissue contrast, flow quantification, perfusion, diffusion, and phase shifts. When we do thermal mapping, we're using echo time on a gradient echo scan to measure phase shifts. It's just a fancy way of doing math to convert MRI signal from image data to thermal data. And that's how we're able to, near real time, every four seconds, get an updated image on this interface to look at our irreversible damage estimate, an anatomic image, a thermal map, and a temperature gradient. 
So over the course of the laser therapy, we're able to monitor the area that we've contoured to. These blue cursors are over things that we don't want to hurt, like the bladder wall and the neurovascular bundles and the rectal wall. So should the temperature exceed a preset threshold, the system shuts off with no user interaction. That's why we have such low morbidity from this procedure. The first thing we do is we administer a non-therapeutic dose at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit just to see where the tip is. And once we know we're in the right spot, we crank up the energy to about 60, 70 degrees Celsius, a temperature sufficient for cell death or coagulation necrosis. And I presented this at the European Society of Radiology back in 2011. So again, none of this is new. And here's a case study that we could look at. A patient who had Gleason 3 plus 4, left peripheral zone. We've got this bright lesion here, dark on T2, dark on diffusion. We went in and we did coagulation necrosis of that entire region. You could see the thermal map as well as the coagulation necrosis here and the irreversible damage estimate. Here it is as a side view. We get a nice big margin around it, so we're not worried about recurrence of disease. And then he comes back as part of an IRB-approved protocol at six months for biopsy of that treated area. Even in the absence of any imaging findings, we biopsy the treated area so that we could talk about recurrence rates. If you don't biopsy it, you don't know. You can't assume he's fine. So we biopsy to make sure there's no nothing microscopic brewing that could declare itself later. Another reason why this technique works so well, because unlike other focal methods, the transition zone between treated and untreated tissue is very precise and very thin. Unlike cryo or RF, where you've got a nearly 10 millimeter transition zone between treated and healthy tissue, this fluffy margin here isn't helpful. Um, we like a nice crisp margin. And the summary of phase one, now remember I said phase one is safety and feasibility. Can we do it is the question, and can we do it without killing anyone? So the answer was yes. And we'll um, submit our manuscript for publication. We've been working on it now for three years, but once we hit treatment number 100, um, we're putting it forth for publication. We had 11 salvage patients for biochemical recurrence, and the age range was 50 to 85. PSA, big range, 0.9 to 28, and tumor volumes were tiny to big. And we presented this at the Radiological Society of North America last winter, and I just presented the seven-year interim results of our 20-year survival study, which is phase two at the American Association for Cancer Research in Washington, D.C., two months ago. So in summary, the total procedure time can be one and a half to four hours, we end up with a coagulation necrosis volume of 1.2 to 21 cc's, kind of a, a spectrum, but it depends on the original lesion size. If it's tiny, the coagulation necrosis will be tiny, and if it's huge, the coagulation necrosis will be huge. We had no serious adverse events and no morbidity. One gentleman developed a urinary tract infection that was managed with antibiotics. One patient expelled the carbonized applicator tip. It, um, he passed it like a kidney stone. Uh, one patient required a suprapubic catheter, and I'll tell you about this guy. He was a doctor, and doctors are the worst patients ever because they don't listen. So this guy's like, I don't want a catheter, I don't want a catheter, I don't want a catheter. So we're like, okay, I'm feeding him Gatorades, tell him, can you pee, can you pee? He's like, ah, no, no. So we try Rapaflow, give him Rapaflow, still can't go. Three hours later, he's like, die, and he's like, give me a catheter. So Dr. Feller tried to give him a catheter, but because the inflammation had gone on for like an hour or two, things were just too tight and it would just resist. So he ended up with a super pubic catheter. Grand prize winner. But he, he didn't mind it and he knew why he got it, so he's more cooperative now. <laughs> <laughs> we got two cases of asymptomatic periprostatic necrosis, which is simply when the tumor abuts the margin of the gland, when there's capsular contact, um, we'll treat it, and we'll treat it all the way out to the capsule. And what happens is it puckers in on itself when it heals. So it's an it's a asymptomatic thing. It's a benign thing. But when you look at the gland, you'll see there's a little pucker and some loss of volume. Um, and we got five guys who developed retention cysts. Sometimes some people, when they scrape their knee or get any kind of a, a cut or whatever, they get a little serous fluid bubble next to it. Some guys, when you do the coagulation necrosis on them, they develop a little bubble and then it pops and resolves on its own eventually. We could go in and poke it, but we figure it'll resolve on its own. So the positive margin rate in phase one was around 26%. 
Currently, we're hovering around 23, 22%. When I talk about positive margins, in the treatment naive guys, it could be recurrence at the treatment site, or it could be something got le that got left behind. In some guys, what we do is we offer them the treatment, telling them, you know, this thing is right up on your urethral, urethral sphincter, and if we do it, we may have to do it again, because we don't want to be super aggressive and render you incontinent. So we may do it like in a phased approach. So that kind of residual disease, I'm not so worried about. And in men who are salvage patients, where we go in and debulk stuff in the seminal vesicle, in the bladder wall, and in the gland, we know there's probably going to be residual, but the goal with them is life-extending palliative care and debulking of the tumor, not complete obliteration of the tumor. And then in some cases, we'll have a positive biopsy at six months, but it's not the treated area, it's something new. And if that something new comes back positive for malignancy and he's got marginal recurrence or residual disease, I nickname that guy whack-a-mole, and we're not going to chase that lesion around, we're going to the whole gland therapy the guy. So um, when we look at what was the um, outcomes in terms of PSA, in the treatment naive guys who never had anything before they saw us, the PSAs decreased about 35% overall. In, um, international prostate symptom scores for urologic function recovered at 12 months, and SHIM scores recovered at 12 months also. In the salvage population, um, we have less of them. Right now I've got 16 salvage guys. At this time I had 11. There was a higher decline in PSA because these gentlemen presented with much higher PSAs initially, and then the IPSSs, no statistically significant change, nor in SHIM scores. So in terms of withdrawal from our study, uh, one patient passed away from metastatic melanoma. Uh, one patient de developed metastatic melanoma over the course of the study, and he withdrew for that reason, but he has now passed away of his skin cancer. Three patients withdrew for personal reasons. One withdrew after a negative six-month biopsy because of travel. Two guys elected radiation therapy. Five went on to whole gland therapy. Sad about this was one of them was a four plus four that went on to surgery and was downgraded to four plus three. So he could have stayed in the study but had prostatectomy. And our surgeons tell us that they don't experience any difficulty with radical prostatectomy after laser because it's like we go in, we do what we're doing, and we get out. We don't do anything to the tissue or the nerves or the anything around the glands. So the surgical dissection is technically not affected by what we do. And so our conclusion from phase one is that this is um, very feasible and safe. Recurrence rates around 25%, whole gland therapy rates around 5%. Patients remain retreatment viable for either laser or whole gland therapy. We don't burn any bridges. And there's a continuity of imaging modality using MRI for diagnosis, for biopsy, for treatment, and for monitoring of response to treatment. So then what happens in recurrent disease? MRI is great for picking it up, but we can't detect spread. We can't see bone or other organ or lymph node mets with a regular multiparametric MRI. So something um, to consider, um, the diagnostic accuracy of standard imaging tests for identification of recurrence is super low. The um, majority of standard imaging tests can be negative um, when, in fact, the guy's harboring distant disease. So why do we want to use PET-CT? We want to do it to detect metastatic disease, to restage patients who may have disease progression in the setting of biochemical recurrence, to monitor treatment response, and also for primary staging linked to very um, high-risk disease in men with real high PSAs. The current radionuclides available are FDG, um, F18, C11 acetate, and Axamen. We're going to talk about Axamen today because it's the newest one on the market. It was FDA cleared late in 2016, well, mid-2016, and we got it at Desert Medical Imaging to use in patients with high PSAs and also in um, any setting where there's concern for biochemical recurrence. The molecular structure of it, it's an amino acid uptake agent. It's a synthetic agent. And the thing that we like about it is it's a squirt and scan kind of agent. You don't have to um, have the patient wait around for an hour to optimize the, the sensitivity of the radionuclide. Initially, like right immediately after, after injecting the patient, we have good separation of tissue if we scan over the first 30 minutes post-administration. 
And when we look at what we're able to see, here's a case study of a gentleman with a 0.73 PSA post-prostatectomy. He had a negative lymphadenectomy, negative skeletal screening, and we found a presacral node in him. We can also see recurrent disease, local recurrence. This gentleman had um, radiation therapy for Gleason 7 in a short course of androgen deprivation therapy. His PSA got up to almost 30, and so we see this local recurrence. Here's another case. Um, this is a patient with a 3 PSA post-prostatectomy, and you could see some bony involvement there. And then here's another male, 60 or 61 years old, 0.4 PSA after robotic prostatectomy. Uh, um, Axumin picked up an 8 millimeter mesorectal lymph node. So um, these sponsored studies did really well in proving how good this agent is to pick up lymph node and other organ mets. And if you're interested in any of the references, use your smartphone and take a picture of this. This is a short bibliography of the published data. And I'll, I'll give um, Jean and George this presentation so those of you who want it can get it as a PDF. So now on to biomarkers. We've talked about imaging. We've talked about image-guided biopsy. We talked about histology. We talked about imaging in the setting of recurrence. What do biomarkers bring to the table? A lot of people go, nothing. Doesn't matter to me. We're going to do surgery anyway. It's not going to give us any insight. That's okay for them, but for us, because what we're doing is focal treatment. As important as doing it on the men who should have it, it's equally important not to do it on the men who shouldn't have it. And Gleason's score isn't good enough for us to determine who those guys are. Genomics, I think, will lend some insight into that and give us some good prognostic um, value. So a biomarker is a characteristic, any characteristic, that's objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacologic response to a therapeutic intervention. What do we use at Desert Medical Imaging? These are all biomarkers in our minds, PSA, PSA density, tumor volume, tumor staging, ADC, pharmacokinetics, PIRAD score, biopsy targeting, Gleason score, and genomics. All these things are taken into account with every patient that we see. So what are the genomic tests that are on the market? There's bunches of them, bunches. But the ones that are most f uh, familiar to patients are confirm MDX. If your biopsy is negative and everybody thinks you have cancer, they suggest doing this all over the habitat, all over the gland, 18 or 20 cores, and that's how that test is marketed. Prostivision is two genes, ERG and P10. Prolaris is a 20-something gene panel. Oncotype DX, 20-something gene panel. Decipher, 20-something gene panel. But three years ago at AUA, I walked up to the owner of this company and I said, when are you going to do Decipher on cores? Because Decipher had only been used on whole mount prostatectomy specimens to determine if the patient should go on to radiation therapy on top of his surgery. So they could get a five and 10 year metastatic risk profile from the geno genomic pathways. So my question was, why not do it on cores? If you could do it on tissue from prostatectomy, why can't you do it on cores? And I said, when are you going to do it? And he said, never. And I said, why? And predictably, he said, because cores are garbage. They're random. I said, what if I gave you gold? What if I gave you an 18-gauge specimen that was 1.7 centimeters long that was 20 or 30 percent tumor? Could you extract enough RNA from that sample to give me a genomic profile on the patient? He's like, let me think about it. So last year, February of 2016, Decipher released Decipher for cores. First thing I did was I went back in my population of men who had had focal laser therapy, who I had biopsy results on pre-treatment, and put all their specimens in for decipher testing. And any guy who had six-month biopsy and I knew his oncologic control status, I categorized them by positive six-month biopsy and negative six-month biopsy and by genomic profile. And I'll show you what clusters I came up with. So let me talk first about prostivision. ERG is a gene that if it's overexpressed, it's an indicator of fast time to biochemical recurrence. P10 is an indicator of a man's immunosuppressive ability to fight his disease, and each man is born with two P10 alleles. And I liken P10 to the brakes on a bike. You've got the front brakes and you've got the back brakes. And I liken ERG 
to the bike itself and the path you're on. If you don't overexpress ERG, your bike's on a nice, calm back road trail. If you're overexpressing ERG, you're going down a wild mountain trail, okay? If you're missing P10, if, you got, if you're missing one the way the test is marketed, you're okay because you got the other. If you're missing the other, you're okay because you got the other. But if you're missing both, you're in trouble because it's like both brakes are gone. That's how the test is marketed. But in my very small series, I'm seeing the reverse. I'm seeing that men who are missing both P10s actually do better than the men missing only one. So I spoke to a geneticist at um, UC San Diego about this phenomenon I'm observing. And his suggestion was that there's immune modulation when you're missing both that kicks in that won't kick in if you've still got one. So I'm not going to tell Prost Division to change their scoring system, but in my mind and in my heart and in my scientific brain, I know what I'm seeing. So that being said, let's look at what the scores look like. No ERG overexpression, no P10 deletion, score two. No ERG overexpression, hemizygous, P10 deletion, only missing one, score a four. Overexpression of ERG, but intact normal P10, score a four. ERG overexpression and hemizygous deletion of P10, score six. Overexpression of ERG, homozygous deletion of P10, score a nine. I'm thinking those two should be flopped, but I don't know yet. My series is too small. And then there's always the possibility that that core only possessed like 5% tumor. There may not be enough tissue to do the test on, and that's often the case if there's not much. So... Decipher used to be marketed as post-operative only for all patients to assess adverse pathology after prostatectomy. No more. They still do it post-prostatectomy, but we now can do it on cores. We do a 22 genomic pathway, and with the patient's consent, I enter him into a research study where we're looking at a group of 35 genes, a, group of a, a bunch of hundreds of genes and signatures, thousands of genes, and ultimately the 1.4 million genomic panel pathway database. And this is just a sample of a report. And I look at, is the man's status low risk, average risk, or high risk? And um, Cooperberg and Ross published their post-prostatectomy results. These results are well accepted, and the use of Decipher can accurately predict prostate cancer-specific mortality. And that's what I'm witnessing in my small series. Also, um, Decipher coupled with Capra outperforms Capra or Decipher by themselves. So we'll look at some cases. This is a 67-year-old with 4 plus 3 in his right peripheral zone. He had two negative trust biopsies. We picked it up with MR-guided biopsy. His PSA was 8.3, and he had a laser in September 2015. He nadered out, and those of you that don't know what a nader is, after your therapy, if you undergo therapy, your PSA should go down. The lowest level it goes to after your treatment is called your nadir. And in the world of radiation oncology, if the nadir is um, exceeded by two full points at any point post-treatment, it's time to start looking at it again and seeing what's going on and evaluate for biochemical recurrence. So at his, at his six-month biopsy, he had a negative result. Good. He had very low risk prost division and average risk decipher. So I'm thinking he'll do well over the long haul. Hopefully, um, prostate cancer will not lead to his demise. This case, a 66-year-old with 3 plus 3, he had multiple negative trusses. Uh, we picked his up with MR-guided biopsy with a PSA of 2.1. His laser was December 2015. His PSA didn't quite nadir where we would have liked it to, um, but he had a negative MR-guided biopsy with low-risk decipher and low-risk prost division. Here's another guy, 76 years old, 3 plus 4, left peripheral zone, PSA 6.8, laser March of 2014. Now remember, the Decipher test wasn't even available until February of last year, so I facilitated the coordination of the procurement of the original pretreatment specimens because you could test them up to seven years after. And then he had a negative six-month biopsy, but look at this. His Decipher score was 0.75. His biopsy was positive at two years post-treatment. His PSA went to 6.1. He had a recurrent 3 plus 4 at two years post-treatment. This guy, 
He was 55 at the time he was treated. Currently, he's 60. We lasered him in January of 2011. He natured at 4.1. His PSA went to 6.3 in August of 2012. We repeated the laser in August of 2012. He only natured at 3.4, but look at him, 0.82, high risk. He also developed colorectal cancer. So I think these decipher scores are going to be helpful for things beyond prostate, but we'll see. I need to look five years from now at what happened. His PSA went to 5.8 in January 2016. The laser was repeated in August of 2016, and then he came back with a positive colonoscopy. So the clusters that I'm seeing, oops, excuse me. The clusters that I'm seeing are, um, I can't say they're super impressive right now because out of the 30 men I have data for um, ERG and P10 only, the ones with the negative biopsy, there's a cluster of 10 of them that had normal ERG and normal P10 and negative six month biopsy. So our data is suggesting that guys with low risk prost division are good candidates for focal therapy. Um, the one other thing that I noticed was this cluster of ERG positive and hemizygous P10 that I would have expected to be in this box, and I would have expected the one to be in this box. But in our experience clinically, we need to collect this information for at least the next five years, and I need to take all the guys in the study and categorize them by who did really good, who didn't do so well, and who went crazy with fast progression to disease and uh, advanced disease that was lethal. So um, this is an interesting paper about intertumoral heterogeneity. I talked about that early on. This is why it's so important that we aim the core at the part that looks scariest on the MRI to get really good genomic data. And this was published recently talking about, in any transcriptome-wide analysis of MR image prost prostate specimens, and high-risk prostate cancer patients, we have to hit the target. Hitting anything but the target might not yield accurate information. So I think we can probably, in five years, look at men with kind of a simple symphony and guys with a complex symphony, because I believe genomics isn't simply ERG, P10, Sparkle 1, Spink 1. It's symphonies of aberrations that certain men possess that lead to their advanced disease or their disease progression. And genomics helps us learn about the person. Hippocrates said it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. So in summary, there's an emerging role for integrated biomarkers that are diagnostic and prognostic, including PSA, MRI, MR-targeted biopsy, Gleason score, and genomics. There'll be improved nomograms, and uh, predictive cancer probability maps will be based on machine learning, I believe. And we need more prospective randomized clinical trials to validate everything that we're witnessing in clinical practice and in our research program. Um, some more references. And um, Jean alluded to the International Laser Network. So I'm the founder, and the reason why I created this organization was so we could harmonize the techniques that we all use, because there's about 10 sites in the world that do a variation on a theme of what we do. And the places that we train adhere pretty much to our protocol. And if I'm ever going to do an international multi-center study, I need everybody to do everything the same way. So we're going to harmonize the technique, the data collection intervals, and the patient reported outcomes measures. So the president of the International Laser Network is Jürgen Futterer from University of Radboud, Nijmegen in the Netherlands. The vice president is Sangeet Guy from University of Toronto, and I'm the secretary treasurer and CFO. I have to acknowledge all the patients who have the courage to be research subjects. I know all of you have um, clinical management teams, but if you ever decide to be in a clinical trial, you're contributing to a body of knowledge that would not exist if men like you didn't raise your hand and say, I'll try that and, and see what happens. It takes a lot of courage. Um, I want to also acknowledge um, Dr. John Feller, my medical director and mentor. Um, I want to honor the memory of Dr. Stuart May, those of you who knew him, um, he passed away on January 22nd of this year of a massive heart attack. Um, we miss him, and we keep doing our work in his honor. And I also want to uh, posthumously acknowledge Roger McNichols, my research partner, um, who passed away about five years ago. Um, Axel Winkel is this gentleman here. He owns the patent on the hardware that we use. Uh, he works at Philips. And um, Wes Jones, the gentleman here, is our 
illustrious MRI technologist without whom much of this development work would never have been possible because if you don't have a competent MRI tech, you, you, you have nothing. Um, Andrew Farrell is my professor at University of Edinburgh. Elda Rayleigh is the co-founder of Focus on Research from whom I received the Research Advocacy Network um, Focus on Research Scholarship in 2015. And um, I received a quarter million dollar endowment from Vinnie Smith to form the Focal Therapy Foundation to fund treatment for men who can't afford it. And this year I was named Army Women's Foundation Graduate Program Legacy Scholarship recipient. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, now is a great time. If you're shy, you can always email me or call me or um, send Jean a note. I'm sorry? Thank you. <laughs> that was a lot to digest. And I also want to say hello and good morning to my friend, Dr. Ross Schwartzberg. I mentioned that I had a, a, a pleasant evening with a, a number of experts in imaging and radiation therapy. And I think what we have to do is look at prostate cancer manage, management along a continuum. We have to seek early detection, early diagnosis, early treatment, or monitoring, active surveillance, minimally invasive treatments, and save the kitchen sink for when you need it. It's a stepwise progression. And those of you that are really, really studious and you want to learn a bunch, go to nccn.org and find the patient prostate cancer guidelines. And somewhere around page 45 or 46, they talk about treatment options, they talk about clinical trials, they talk about the order in which things should be given so that the kitchen sink remains available. You don't want to burn any bridges by doing everything right out of the gates. All right, let's open up the questions. We're going to scan the group. Let's start over here. Any questions over here? NCCN, November, Charlie, Charlie, November, dot org. And that's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and they publish oncology guidelines for the United States. Okay, question. I know you have to go over it quickly, but questions related to diagnostics. Uh, one of the areas that you didn't mention was the PSMA-based yeah, so DCFPYL is would, one of them. Would you please repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, the question was, in my discussion about advanced imaging, I didn't discuss PSMA agents. So at University of Wisconsin at Johns Hopkins, something called DCFPYL was developed, which is a prostate-specific membrane antigen agent. So I'm currently working with the company that makes it. They're called Progenix, and I've written a protocol so that we can transition our Aximan research to PSMA when it becomes available. So there are very few sites in the world that have it, um, but you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and type in DCFPYL, and you'll see sites that are in the study. Well, there is an alternative available, actually, too, and I just had it done, so I, I want to raise it here. Uh, those are the gallium-68 based PSMA agents. Uh, yeah, UCSF is doing gallium so, so, so UCSF is doing a, a simultaneous dual imaging, the only one in the country with the multi-parametric MRI. However, uh, you can have just the gallium-68 PET CT done, for example, at UCLA and Stanford. There's lots of sites around the country. Yep. And frankly, I ask it to you, I'll give you my opinion, in terms of accuracy and sensitivity, it is far superior to the axiom. You look at the axiom data, almost all the PSAs were much higher. Much higher, and, and also it shows BPH. Yes. That's one of the reasons that we're investigating it. So, so the area that my issue was biochemical recurrence, yep. like you mentioned. The guidelines for treatment are PSAs less than or equal to 0.5. So here we have the issue that the imaging agent's sensitivity is way above yeah. it. By the time you be positive on that, you be full of METs and in really bad shape. Yeah. So uh, the Dr. Hope is running that UCSF trial. He has over 500 patients. Uh, they're publishing on it. Uh, you, you look at our literature, Australia and 
uh, Germany have been utilizing this agent for many, many years. There's very large yep. experience with it. It's a good agent. Yep. So I think DCFPYL is probably going to be better. Um, but so the issue with a lot of the PMSA agents and the radionuclides is availability. Where's the cyclotron? What's the delivery time? What can you use in your outpatient institution or your hospital that you can get your hands on? So, so yeah, and there's also other agents that are nanoparticles. There's like Combidex and Ferromoxetol. You know, there's a whole host of agents that somebody at some point needs to do head-to-head -head comparisons on all of them, but I think industry is not uh, uh, eager to do that. But I'm not advocating for any particular agent. So again, if there is any question of distant disease, you have a ton of options. You could do the gallium 68, you could go to Johns Hopkins and do PSMA, you could do Aximin, you could just do other radionuclides. It depends on what's available in your community. So I think it's a, it's a good question and a good observation. That's the message you want to get out to the group. And for those who, I, I'm just joining, but it seems your last session you had an imaging guy there. I read his review. I'd be curious on what you think. He was uh, downplaying the, the PSMA base uh, and upplaying things like C11 choline, which the literature seems to be. Yeah, the biggest issue with C11 acetate is you have to have a cyclotron. And unless you have one, you can't use it. So it's off the table for my community. The association notes, so I'm urging a little bit of caution in, in the taking home the message that the experts urge there because there are certainly alternative viewpoints that are right. on other agent availabilities. And, and these radionuclides continue to be developed. You know, what was released in May of 2016 is going to be totally replaced by something new, but DCFPYL is not commercially available today. So I'm working with Progenics to get it. So Aximin's the only thing that I can get in the interim to assess men with Gleason 4 disease prior to focal therapy, regardless of PSA, using the radionuclide off-label. So that study has not, are you taping? I hope not. <laughs> I'm not recruiting for a study. I don't have a study. I just wrote the protocol. So as soon as there's a protocol, I'll let people know. But I may get DCFPYL before that happens. All right. Do we have a question, sir? Yes, I'd like to add to what this gentleman has just said. Um, my PSA is 12.66. I've been uh, chasing and trying to find my prostate cancer, recurrent prostate cancer, for five years now at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, with a 511 choline. They're not able to find it. I just had an Aximin scan here two months ago at IHS here in San Diego. Negative scan, they found nothing. I went to San Francisco like this gentleman did, got the gallium 68 PSMA. They found um, two nodules in my lungs that are prostate cancer. Prostate cancer and foci and T11 in my spine and two nodules in my pelvis. And those were biopsy positive? That's the next question, you see, is the biopsy business, and that's a whole other issue about mm -hmm. that. All right, do we have a question back there? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the importance of uh, genomic testing after a biopsy? Uh, second thing is, what is the mechanism of action of laser in killing the tumor? So there were two questions. What's the importance of genomics for biopsy and what's the mechanism of action for the laser focal therapy? So in answer to question number one, the value of genomic testing at the time of biopsy is prognosis in terms of immunosuppressive ability of the patient and behavior of the tumor. We've witnessed in our small series low-risk genomics associated with negative biopsy at six months and high-risk genomics associated with disease progression and recurrence, multiple recurrences. 
So we're still assessing it for clinical utility, and we're using a research panel of 1.4 million genomic pathways to determine what genes other than the well-known ones might be indicators of either immunosuppressive ability or tumor behavior. The mechanism, the mechanism of action for the laser is light. So the light is harnessed at an energy level of somewhere around 13, 14 watts. And heat, it's a thermal interstitial treatment that, that it's essentially instantaneous cell death does by it, heat. Does it attack the nucleus first? That's a great question. It's, uh, it's a tissue-based, so it's not about nanoparticles or something like PDT that goes at a cellular level. It's tissue-based. It's interstitial thermal therapy. Thank you. Thank you. A question here? Okay, over here. Sure. So, do you have information on the immunological response after laser focal therapy? Not yet. That's why I'm studying tumor immunology imaging. <laughs> we have to figure it out. And right now, we don't do any type of microscopy on the tissue. Um, essentially, all we're using is MR imaging and biopsy. Question here? Okay, I have a question. <clears throat> Bernadette, the bottom line on focal laser, laser therapy is what? Is, how does it look, and what's it good for? The bottom line on laser focal therapy of prostate cancer is in carefully selected men, we can achieve oncologic control, and we can avoid the morbidity associated with whole gland therapy. So when you look at things like urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction, no man in our series has suffered either of those side effects. That's the bottom line. What does carefully selected mean? So we're not going to do it in a Gleason 9 or a Gleason 8, although we've done two off protocol. Both were physicians whose physician teams referred them to us because they had organ-confined Gleason 8 and Gleason 9 disease. They did not meet the inclusion criteria for our study. So that's what I mean by carefully selected. And it should be done under a clinical trial. We don't do this as a commercial procedure. It's not like, you know, getting a, you know, a vein laser. You know, this is a cancer treatment, and it should be done as an experimental cancer treatment. When do you expect the uh, clinical trials to be concluded and approved? Um, the clinical trial will end 20 years after we treat the, th the thousandth patient. So we're in it for the long haul, and long after I'm gone, I have successors that are going to be following these men for as long as they live. I have guys in the study that are 40-something years old, so we need to know the long-term oncologic outcomes, and only then are the insurance companies ever going to pay for it, and will it become mainstream. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Okay, let's start back over here. Any questions? All right, over here. Yes, sir. You had a... Uh number, like 25%, I think it was those with positive margins after six months. Is that a first pass? It sounds like you're repeating. Yeah, so the follow-up, that's a good question. So he, he's asking about the six-month bi biopsy positive patients. Do we do serial biopsies on them? So is that about it? Well, uh, that's first of all, that's the first pass for the yield. Uh, 25% failed at six months, right? Correct. But assuming you're repeating those patients, over their lifetime. Yeah, so the protocol... Nothing in life is 100%. I wish I could make it 100%. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some studies and randomize the men to combination therapies, laser plus. Laser plus, I can't say. So we may see that 25 go down to 15 or 10. There are always going to be some men that, for whatever reason, don't do well with a minimally invasive treatment. They need whole gland, radical treatment, systemic therapy. That's the reality. So in our cohort, what we do is we image them at, um, in phase one, three months, six months, and 12 months. We do biopsy at six months, and assuming nothing changes image-wise between 12 and six months, they go on active surveillance. Now, in phase two, we don't do imaging at three months because nothing really changes from the 48-hour and the three-month. The six-month is where we really see change, and then we do the biopsy at six months. Then we image again at 12 months, assuming nothing changed between six and 12. They go on active surveillance. Remember that PSA Nader I talked about? 
If it reaches the Phoenix criteria, which is two full points above the nadir, that's when we reinsert imaging and determine does he need another biopsy. Sometimes guys will get prostatitis or inflammation or things other than cancer that will jack their PSA up. But, um, you know, in a, in a small percentage of these guys, they end up going on to whole gland therapy because they, they just can't respond well to focal. Question. Well, I, just a real quick question is uh, the financial situation. What is the initial cost, or is there any insurance that covering this? Yeah. So the question is about cost, and I'm a real um, advocate for patients, and I understand the financial toxicity of a cancer diagnosis, um, which is the reason I founded the Focal Therapy Foundation. So in our study, it's a clinical trial that's patient funded. We don't have a grant. I wish that somebody dropped a million dollars out of the sky so that we could do these cases. But when you consider what the cost is of the system, of the follow-up, of the pathology, it's a $25,000 entry fee, and each man bears it at his own cost. If your insurance company has a rider for catastrophic cancer care, things like that, you could, on your own, apply for reimbursement. I've had a couple guys take their informed consent document and go back to their insurance company and go, look, I didn't have pre-cert on this. I didn't even have a doctor's order for it, but you guys pay for cryo. Why don't you pay for this? And a couple have gotten partial reimbursement, but I can't advocate for insurance type things. I'm the scientist, the researcher, and we don't do any um, patient uh, 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 pursuit of reimbursement. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, question. What's your opinion of IBM Watson genomics? I love Watson. Watson's phenomenal, and we're a key Watson user, although Watson representatives have not come, back, come out to DMI to harvest my data. Um, for me to take a spreadsheet, has anybody been to my office? I have a spreadsheet that hangs on my back wall that's all these data points and color-coded numbers and things that to me make sense from a cursory review standpoint, and also when I get my biostatistician, who I pay to crunch the numbers to look at it, we find the trends. But Watson is going to be a game changer. It, absolutely, especially if these new um, AI pathology kinds of machines are implemented, and I can feed pathology um, into the machine and kind of reduce that interobserver variability that we talked about. Yeah, I think it holds great promise. Okay, question. Can you make a prediction about guys who have had prostatectomy and have distant metastases? Will the late, will, do you see the focal laser therapy being adaptable to going into other sites in the body? Well, the earliest work done with the laser, and the question was, for guys who have had prostatectomy, do I envision the laser being used in other body parts? And it already has been. Um, I think the general consensus is something like Zofigo would be much more appropriate in that setting. However, if there's local recurrence in the prostate bed, we can ablate that and we do. There's one in the world that we did. Okay, question over here. Come back over here. Yes. Have you heard of uh, CyberKnife? Have I heard of CyberKnife? I just toured CyberKnife yesterday. Yeah, so I hung out... Um, it's radiation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very precisely delivered radiation. So all, any and all side effects associated with radiation could be associated with this. Um, it's an okay treatment for men who should have it, like all other radiation. And I'm not, I'm not an opponent of anything. I'm a proponent of minimally invasive things in correctly identified patients. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so CyberKnife is photons and protons are protons. It's different energy sources. Okay, any other questions? They asked, where did you visit yesterday? The Scripps CyberKnife in, in Vista. So just so you know a little bit about w what we do and how we operate, we're not like... Um, this isn't like something we set out to do commercially to make a bunch of money. This is something that we're doing to prove something works because my goal when I first started doing this was to prove it didn't work. Remember, I worked for industry. I didn't want to spend money on something that didn't work. So I had to prove that it didn't work, but it did. 
So um, then when I went back to industry and said, let's chase this, the understanding was that it's so cheap that it, it's kind of not worth it because, you know, somebody else could do it. So I left and I went back to my clinical roots. You know, I went to nursing school. I was still in high school. I'm a caregiver and a clinician and I work for Dr. Feller and I do the research to do the research. And I rope in the right people to do the right thing. Like Dr. Schwartzberg is here because we share patients, we co-manage patients. I don't care if you go to him. I love it that you go to him. I don't need everybody to come to me. There are so many sick men that need help. What we need to do is standardize what we're doing make it available across the board, and get the guys to the thing that makes the most sense to them, that's least damaging, least traumatic, and has the highest hope for cure. Thank you. Thank you for that You're statement. You're welcome.